Having a Gas is the podcast that chats to the great and the good of the creative industries. And in particular, it finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for cooking to, for dancing to, for f***ing to, and more. Today I'm having a gas with Dave Dye, a legend of the London advertising scene. Dave has been through it all, from sneaking into the industry in the 80s to setting up multiple shops with his own name on the door. Now he is one of the most respected names on the scene. So where are you then? Where's that? You look like you're in a Greek restaurant there with all the foliage in the background. If only. I'm in um, Manchester. This is my uh, flat. I do uh, working from home on Fridays. We're, ba- we're back in our studio now because there's no one else in the building. Oh, really? Well, yeah. Yeah, nice. Now, how nice. is it down, down in London? Are you all still, all still remote? Uh, well, I've, it, it's kind of normalising a bit. It feels a little bit too soon to me fractionally but i don't know so i've just come back from a run so i'm a bit disheveled and smelly but most of the um people you come across are yeah are not wearing masks there's still lots of um uh cues with the correct distance and stuff but yeah who knows you know it's going down at the moment let's not hope there's not a backlash but yeah so um before we start i suppose we'll just say you know if we get any connection problems and it goes really bad we'll just do a you know i'll disconnect and reconnect but it should be all right sure okay do you edit these things or not i do one podcast where i don't edit anything there's people sniffing coughing and gaps all over the place and then one where it's all edited together that i'm doing with my mate parv that's all oh is that um is that parv from wave yeah yeah we've been doing a, a daily one checking in with people and what's happening in there you know, uh, what's happening, you know, that in isolation, we've done about 50, one in one a day, we've been pointing out, which is horrendous um, <laughs> in terms of, because <clears throat> you either do a day where you do eight on the trot in the space of about five hours, so you're absolutely wrecked by the time. It sounds ridiculous, it's not like working in a coal mine, but after, you know, half an hour, next one, next one, questions this, trying to pay attention. Mm. Five hours in, you just wrecked. I am anyway, in here. But, um, but we've been trying to put one out every day, just about 15 minutes of nonsense, really. So you're going to become the uh, the Joe Rogan of our industry? God, I don't know. I don't know how I've ended up doing it. It's like uh, I would put myself down as the least likely person to do this. Yeah. So it's a complete accident I've ended up doing it. It's only because I was interviewing people with um, words, was the technical Thing that they call them with sort of you know sending them questions and getting them to answer it over email and, and there was a few people i got got to who said oh i can't be asked to fill in a load of questions but i'll happily talk to you for a couple of hours yeah so yeah. i recorded it transcribed it and then put it out but i thought god it sounds better when you hear it because you can hear their you know because you'd have to edit it. So, sometimes you'd interview someone and they'd really swear like joe Settlemeyer, and he'd be really swearing and you think when you transcribe it he look. He comes off badly when you put shit, fuck, <laughs> fuck that. But you, so you sort of have to manipulate a bit. Whereas when you listen to it, it's quite funny. So anyway. Yeah, I know what you're getting actually because um, I was um, thinking this morning about uh, Christopher Hitchens said it's good to unify the written and the spoken word. And when you're doing these text interviews, you're having to get rid of all the idiosyncrasies of everyone's speech, whereas it comes and sings in the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All the nuances go. It's it's a very different thing. So. I ended up doing that, and then because I did that, I've ended up doing these Wave and Dave ones, which is a whole different sort of thing. So, so in a way, yeah, I'm sort of the least likely person to do do this. I don't know how I've ended up doing it, but, but I quite like it. It's quite nice. Well, for ours, you you couldn't have picked a better uh, background, really. It looks very studious and very musical in there. Does it? Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's stripped in. Yeah. It's not stripped in, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all old books and magazines and nonsense that I use sometimes when I'm doing... Uh, blog posts and stuff teaching or whatever it may be i actually um i first came across uh, your work because i as soon as i mentioned i was doing podcasting all the creatives said oh yeah i listen to dave dye's thing and so and I, i'd heard your name before and i'll tell you why in a moment but i went on your blog and the first thing i read was the bill burnback interview that you found um all right and i thought that was really good because well, it's like, you know, serendipity, something can just cross your attention span and, and can be really useful to you. And I really liked Burnback's idea that he wasn't really a trained ad, ad man. And so he yeah. was un, uncluttered by culture. And I thought that was a really yeah. interesting way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, he's he's uh, yeah. It's a funny business where people. I think uh, people in advertising like to reject. They like to be really cool and say, "Oh no, I'm just about the future. I'm not about anything that's gone before," which is bizarre because obviously yeah. you only learn from what's gone before. You can't learn from what's uh, happening next year. Yeah. Um, so you know, so I quite like unearthing and finding these bits and pieces that I like, or old interviews, or asking people whoever it may be john Hegarty or whatever mm-hmm. how they did this or that i suppose it's the sort of thing that i would have liked to have had as a resource when i was getting into the business and trying to figure out how you do good ads you know it's one sort of central place yeah well it took me a while to be honest because i got it we're a music composition studio and i got into it because i wanted to be a musician not not an advertising person and at first i was you know like most young people who think they're artists i was kind of off advertising yeah. i don't want to sell stuff but no, um <laughs> but um, then and I, I always hesitate before telling people this but then I watched Mad Men because I was like I may as well see what other people think it's like and I was like it's actually really cool maybe it's an alright industry actually so then I started to get into the culture a bit yeah but, but it probably was 50 years ago I don't know how cool it is now it's changed a lot obviously yeah. I was in it 50 years ago but um, yeah you know it goes through different sort of cycles that I think it certainly looks cool in Mad Men yeah yeah well, that's the era. I spoke to Sally Miller the other day at Hogarth and uh, Ogilvy, and she was saying when she joined the business, it was still um, the creative is king, the creative director is king, the client bows to them, and everyone else bows to them. And whereas now it's much more client led. Have you? She must be old. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that to her, but um, uh, she certainly didn't seem it. But um, yeah, we, we, did you witness that transformation going from the sort of you know the creatives being in charge to the client? Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, it's never been a, an industry-wide thing. You know, it's only ever been... I, I'll sort of interview people and research things as much as anyone, to be honest. And it's never been uh, that the whole industry would work in a similar way. So, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there would be pockets of amazing places, BBH and GGT and... Abbott Mead, wherever it may be, mm-hmm. uh, CDP, but the majority would be terrible. It'd be the big, boring places that produce uh, patronising, dull stuff. That's the major. That's always the majority mm-hmm. throughout. Even when people will say, "Oh, that was a golden era," or "That was amazing," then the majority would still be garbage. They would yeah. just be. Um, I mean, Chris Palmer described it quite well, I think, on one of my podcasts, where he said that they used to get a reel come round every month and there would be whatever the output would be of TV commercials that month. I can't remember how many it would have been, 50, say. He said, and there'd be like two or three really great ones that you'd think, God, that's annoying that they've done that. He said, and it just feels like, you know, that that if it was a peak, that little top bit has just been knocked off. So there's just quite, there's not quite as many of those amazing ones on a regular basis. So there's still, you know, it's still great things. It just doesn't seem like lots of great things. It doesn't seem like lots of surprises, lots of people trying different things or things hitting you in a different way. It feels a bit homogenised for me. Why, why do, you, do, you, do you have any inkling as to why that is? Um, God, it's quite a... Yeah, so to me it seems like a collision of all sorts of things. I think when things went digital uh which i suppose started around the the sort of in a big way the 2000s yeah there was a sort of this big thing of that everybody involved in digital said traditional agencies are dead and they're dinosaurs then there was a whole bunch of people who jumped on the digital bandwagon to say hooray we're the we're the cool kids doing this stuff that's dead yeah um so then then the sort of talking to the masses and doing things at the time there would have been Guinness Surfer and things like that which would still be rare but amazing stuff for some reason even though it would everybody seemed to like that stuff and that would include in the public and that would talk to millions of people um, doing these little pop-up banners and things people got really excited about Hmm. Um, so then the business got caught in a bit of a there was a sort of I don't know what the technical word is, is it a schism where people lost confidence in what they'd been doing 
nobody seemed to quite get uh, digital in the sense of, you know, on the on the first showing of it, it all seemed a bit rinky dink and not very exciting, not really. Everyone's on a computer, everyone's looking at the net, but in terms of the actual advertising that was on it, it was awful. Yeah. You know, there's like literally, uh, you can name the amazing examples on one or two hands, really. You know, um, BMW Films, uh, Subservient Chicken, there's, there's a few examples that popped up that were fantastic and a new way of doing things that everybody got excited about. Sorry. Um, but Anyway, so it's, it's going to take me about an hour and a half to answer this question. And people are calling me, which I should have turned that off. So, are you going to edit this out, or do I just keep going? Or we just keep going? Yeah, I don't know, just keep going. I will I will let the world see you getting all your calls. So anyway, I, I, I'm just conscious that I could go into the weekend by the time I get to the end of this. Mm, mm. So anyway, so basically, the people who were doing what they call traditional advertising seem to lose their confidence there was a whole bunch of digital advertising. The people I've talked to it now who set up those early digital companies say, oh, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We were just slagging off traditional agencies because it was good business, and uh, but we didn't really know what we were doing. So it was a sort of confusing mess. So everybody sort of lost a lot of confidence. The fees come tumbling down. People were got rid of. The staffing changed, certainly in creative departments. It was about trying to find... Uh, people who were sort of, what was the word? There was digital natives and there was all terminology kicking around. Yeah. And ironically now, nearly 20 years later, it seems to digital is one of the channels we use. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's no longer like a black art or a special thing or particularly things. Interestingly, you know, if I'll, I'll do a talk at college, it's, it's often not the one that excites the students coming into it the most. They probably still get most excited about TV or probably outdoor. Um, anyway, what was the question? Why well, is it like that? So that... somehow it's lost its it lost its way. On on that last point, it's interesting to say that the um, I don't know if it's just advertisers. I think it's just everyone in general are always keen to hoover up the very very young. It's like how do we appeal to them? How do we appeal to teenagers? How do we appeal to young people? Gen Z, millennials. Yeah. And it's interesting that you said even then. At that age, you go and talk to them and they still want to do the big TVC, the big idea, the big campaign, the big poster. They don't want to do five-second pre-rolls. Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah, well, why would they? They want to do that. You know, so it's interesting for me around that time when, uh, you, you know, creatives at that time, I may have been in my 30s, whatever it would be, uh, and you get called dinosaur and now uh, that's just the, the new ways this and it but at the same time the students would come to you with their fresh out of college and uh, they were they thought digital was garbage most of them they weren't interested in that it was it wasn't exciting to them it was just you know doing banners and pop-ups and whatever the main you know the main quantity of digital would be that's the least the last thing they're interested in so they were interested in all the sort of glamorous end the big stuff that lots of people saw and that was public so if you do a tv ad it's exciting because lots of people see it and you're mm. aware that they've seen it yeah and if you do outdoor it's the same thing people walk past it and you see it if you do something um on the net often it comes and goes you don't really have any sense that it's happened you get a spreadsheet with some numbers saying you know what the results are and what happened but you don't feel you know you don't feel it really yeah um, so most of the people getting into the business, they want to still want to do things that uh, that the public can see that they've created. They, you want people to see your ideas and your work and stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's like um, in the, the to, on the same thread of me saying I wanted to be you know, a musician because I want everyone to hear my music and then in adverts people want to get into advertising they want everyone to see their adverts and I saw you saying something similar in your Shots Magazine interview uh, you said you got into advertising because you wanted to make stuff that millions of people would be able to see yeah and yeah I mean that's the that's the um, I mean if you whatever area of creativity you're in if you're really into it you want to create something and then have lots of people see it if you're proud of it or you know, if you create a, an ad that's funny, you want lots of people to laugh or whatever the, the thing may be. So um, particularly with advertising more than anything, the whole game is to engage as many people as possible. It's not like uh, fashion or other things. You're trying to attract people's attention and 
whatever. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think uh, I was listening to Rory Sutherland on his On Brand podcast and he said um, in the 80s, I can't remember, it was a significant proportion, it may have been a third or two thirds of the entire advertising budget was provided by people who made packaged goods and yeah. um, they certainly had to have an idea about how to advertise because that's what packaged goods are, it has to stand out somehow, whereas yeah. now an awful lot of the brands are... Uh, Digital services, services, mobile phone networks, yes, exactly. And yeah. uh, the people occupying those businesses are from a much more, uh, what you might call, um, data-driven point of view. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think <clears throat> whenever I've worked with people in those kind of businesses from the digital with digital backgrounds, they've been more receptive to... Um, advertising and creativity than other areas because it's often something they've not considered and they don't consider themselves experts in it. Whereas if you do something for, you know, Heinz or something, they've got a thousand years and tons of research and systems that go into producing their ads and marketing. So they feel like they've got that covered. Often if you talk to a newish um, digital business and, and lots of them are new, they're a little bit more open about how they um, cut through, get attention, put their message over, all that sort of stuff. I found in my, you know, a sample of one, but uh, generally. But it, yeah, it's interesting how these things change over time. You know, you go back, I sometimes do an interview with people on my podcast and you find their work and then you'll find a 60 second TV commercial for a box of matches, which seems bizarre now that that could ever have, you know, matches could ever have funded these big glamorous commercials or outdoor campaigns you know um and yeah now it's it's a different uh, yeah it's different things yeah um it was interesting actually on that on the point of the shots magazine that's uh how I, that's 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 how you were sort of in the in the in the air in our office let's say because uh the you were the cover story on uh, on this issue from a few years ago dave die i ink therefore i am and uh, the reason we have that is because that's the first uh, issue that uh, that we appeared in because it was like a music right. special and so there was a you know a bit about fa uh, a bit about yeah factory a bit about us a bit about uh, a few of the other people i'm pretty sure wave was in it as well but anyway i did i had a read of that the other day just to sort of get get uh, get prepped and um i was interested in that <laughs> I was interested in the uh, the journey you've had from. Well, I, I, it sounds like you you know didn't you didn't start out thinking I'm going to be in ads, but then you know you founded a number of your own places as well. And um, you know how have you have you found the uh, the difference between being you know in house and employed versus being the founder and the owner? Like you know which one are you more at ease with? Um, I don't know. I think they're different according to where you are in terms of your career and age I think um, you know I, I loved being at places like um, Simons Palmer, Ligas Delaney, BMP which is now DDB, Abbott Mead you know they were fantastic some of the best agencies at the time and you don't realize until afterwards but as a creative you if you're not a partner you, you don't have so much stress. You're thinking about the work, all your, you've got a very small little um, focus, which is to come up with ideas, make them as good as you can. So when you do pitches, for example, it's, if you win or lose, all you think is, oh, that's good because we can make the work. Oh, that's a pain because I wanted to make that work. You don't think of the consequence that may pay a million pound in fees or that may pe keep people employed or mean that, people have to go or there's no consequences to anything they yeah. weren't to me it would just be about do i want to make that work is that as good as i think it could be which is a sort of you know you're in a sort of um what's the word uh that little gilded cage really you, you've mm -hmm. got no real responsibilities other than you know trying to do the best work you can but if you've been doing it <laughs> A while at a reasonable level you start to have opinions on, on all sorts of things you know you start to think well should we be pitching for this is that the right thing should we be 
trying to do better work across the board and not just on this count and that all these daft things that you start to sort of get involved in and and have opinions on ethics and other stuff mm. you know um mm. so you end up starting your own agency you know uh, which is which is um which is quite hard it's harder than it looks you know um uh what can I say about it? I mean, the, the, you know, the, uh, probably when you start your own agency, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. So if you win a pit, if you lose a pitch and it's your place, it's, it's, you take it very, very personally. It's, it's tough. And then if you win a pitch, it's amazing, you know, whereas when you do that, when you're working for someone else, you know, it's sort of, if you win it, it's there. If you lose it, it's there. But it's not so extreme because when it's your place, the difference means that you hire another bunch of people or you, you know, you've got more stability or there's a whole bunch of things that come with it beyond just the work. Yeah. Um, it's a bit more complicated, obviously, when you, when you start your own company and often when like me, creatives start companies going on from what we were talking about earlier, being in this sort of gilded cage, you've got no idea how businesses run clueless you just, yeah. just wafting in and out with your coffee yeah trying to do ideas and and um debate this one against that one you know you're not really thinking about profit and loss and five-year plans and anything like that yeah that's one of the things that's built we we built into the dna of our company um because our our md was previously a sales director and so he had the perspective that you're now describing which is knowing the the you know the stresses and the pains of being the one that wins the business and so he, he wanted to build into the dna that anyone who wants to come and compose music also should have a good relationship with bringing in clients and um yep. yeah i was wondering for you how did because i, I found it quite at first, uh, an anxiety-inducing process of you know trying to go out and make introductions and bring them in. How did you find that going from creative to being the one that brings in the new business? Um, well, I don't know whether I've ever been the one that brings in new business. I mean, occasionally there may be uh, people that I know or people get in touch, but I, uh, I wouldn't say that I sort of necessarily bring it in. Um, mm. Yeah, I think... You know, again, in the in the agency side, often the the creatives who set up their own companies don't rarely do it for the money or the finance. It's generally for the work, for whatever reason that may be. It sounds weird. For the creative um, freedom. Kind of, although ironically, I think you probably have less creative freedom because the um, because the decisions that you make if you decide we can't work with this client because we have such differing views and our standards are there and theirs are not. Then if you decide to part ways, you might also have to part ways with uh, members of staff. Yeah. So then that becomes a much bigger decision than at, if I'd have been at Abbott Mead and was working on BT or something and there was a problem, you go, well, let's work on, you know, trying to think what else they had but Sainsbury's or this you just yeah. move around it doesn't it's not there's no real consequences you just move around so in a way I think you to some degree you have slightly less creative freedom um, because you have to factor in a lot more things mm. um, and I think yeah the, the the element of dealing with the the business side of it is is tough because most practitioners and i'm sure you're probably the same you would rather um you know you'd rather spend time working on something with music than something with numbers um so you know you try and do both and you try and do what you can on the business side but uh if it's not where your heart is it's it's, a t it's tough it's very tough and so yeah i try i always try and view the the business side of things as basically just uh you know 
it's all about relationships and as long as you know you're good friends with the people you're working for in so far as you can be that tends to make the process easier i do try as you're saying to keep out of the spreadsheets and the projections because that can really drive you down a hole and some people are very good at looking at that stuff and staying detached and not emotionally invested yeah. but as you say when you know when you know what the consequences of every pound and penny are it it, it does make things quite different yeah it sometimes can be uh, inhibiting yeah, you know, and I think you—it's good to be aware of that. But you—you want to do what you want to contribute to the business. What you, where your skill sets are, me contributing to the financial uh, spreadsheet side probably wouldn't be a good use of me. <laughs> Maybe not, um, but um, but you certainly you've been what you you're a fundamentally an art director, aren't you? That's the that's your niche. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. what are you, because I know you've got a few different plates spinning at the moment. So I was interested to know about what you're doing with the, is it love or fear or love and fear? Love or fear. Yeah, um, yeah we, uh, <coughs> well, this is my third company. And uh, hilariously, I set up one two weeks before 9-11. Oh, wow. Uh, the next one was six months before the financial crash of 2008. So you're good at picking times, yeah. (laughs) And this one about four months before the (laughs) global pandemic of 2020, which is bizarre. Uh, So there's going to be industry analysts going, right, Dave Dye setting up another company, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, sell off your shares. So so this one I think is, um, I mean, it's it's basically called Love or Fear because... uh, uh, it, it seemed that lots of people are very um, tech focused, and I suppose we're human focused. So yes. we wanted something that was based on uh, trying to get through to humans and using psychology. And we use therapists and people to try and understand how people think or why they ha- may have issues or blocks with certain products or categories or whatever it may be, and factor that in. Um, at an early stage, which is why it's called Love or Fear. They're the sort of two biggest triggers to uh, people doing things. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's it's a sort of strange time. I mean, funnily enough, it I, I don't know how it's been for most people during this period of isolation, but it started off badly for us when one pitch that we just won that was quite big said, we'll talk to you in January 2021. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, what can you say? It's completely understandable. And then another client, we were about to go into... Uh, pre-production for a TV campaign um, went bust about eight weeks later. It was like a perfect storm of them getting refinance and the pandemic and then nobody wanted it. And it was at night. So we started off like that, which was a pain. But then since then, we've won about three bits of business during this thing with clients that we've never met face to face, which is a sort of strange thing. So, um, So in one sense, obviously, it's a ridiculous... I'll go through the different timings of the various companies. On the upside, if it would have been next year, I would have thought that we would have more staff and infrastructure, that it would have been more of a problem. Uh, yes. Whereas it was so early for us that it didn't, it wasn't, it hasn't been um, too problematic. And everybody seems to have got used to working as we're discussing now yeah. and in a slightly different way. So, um, it's not been as bad as it could be. It's cost us a few clients, um, mm. but you know, there's obviously worse things going on in the world, so it's it's not terrible. But that's definitely something I can uh, relate to. It's if this had happened to us at uh, Gas a few years ago, it would have been so early that we would have been not on sure footing, you know, with our clients and our finances. So that probably would have killed the project. Yeah. And then if it had been in a few years' time, would have had more staff and people would have probably been laid yeah. off etc so we've kind of been in this ideal goldilocks zone for it yeah, so, yeah. In, in, insofar as you can have an ideal pandemic situation but yeah <laughs> yeah mm. yeah i mean i think it was, it'd be interesting going forward i mean in doing this podcast i've been doing on this daily thing yes yeah. uh it's been interesting to ask lots of other people in the business how their work going forward you know the business owners what their views are on offices, how they'd structure them. And most people seem to be reassessing all of that sort of thing. Um, so I don't know the other side of it, whether there will be um, 
sort of less investment in offices, more flexible working, um, you know, clients obviously, you know, certainly in advertising, the thing used to be you needed a, a sort of very showy, you know, the, the MNC Saatchi is the perfect example, their big marble reception on Golden Square mm. with two people teetering around on high hills. Mm. And then upstairs, everybody is like a rabbit hutch and that kind of works for them to some degree that it's very glamorous and opulent. Uh, but I think everybody's got used to working over one of these. Um, and it's it's not ideal, but it's not, I don't, I think it's a kind of quite a evenizer isn't a word, is it? What's the, what's the technical word for when everything's sort of equalized, equalized. it sort of equalizes everything a bit. So if, if you do a pitch and there's a bunch of faces come up, they go through their ideas and there's another bunch of faces. Then arguably there's more focus on what they present than uh, where their office is, how attractive they are. Um, and all of those sort of superficial things that, that uh, perhaps have factored in a little bit more in the past. So yeah, yeah. So we'll see where we'll see where we go from here, pandemic-wise. I know, as you said at the beginning, things feel like they're kind of uh, opening up of their own accord, kind of irrespective of government advice. And in fact, I think it was Rory who pointed out when I spoke to him that it could be that public policy follows public behaviour, and not the other way around, because people. Yeah, it seems them. like that. Yeah, people How lock long themselves did you talk down. To Rory out of, out of interest. I can see where you're going with that question. It was about an hour and forty five minutes. Oh, did you? Excellent. Yeah. And yeah. what? Uh, yeah. And what's your average time for talking to people? About forty four minutes. An hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's only because I I did a podcast with Rory and and we and I've not put it out because we I asked him one question before we started, and he finished answering that forty five minutes in. And then yeah. we run out of time at the other end. So I've got this awkward podcast that's not quite finished that end, but we've got this 45 minutes of question at this end. And I was thinking, do I put out that the answer to that? Which is quite yeah. interesting because I said, what do you, what's advertising? Um, and, I'm, and you think maybe I should put that out as a sort of smaller podcast on its own, but it's... Yes. So I, <laughs> uh, that's the only reason I ask you. No, no, yeah, I, I had... I had really clever and entertaining, so whatever amount you can get of him the better but it's it's yeah no i did have uh that sim i almost ran into that issue because um you i because i couldn't i couldn't set the meeting he sets it up on his end and so um you know he just comes on and goes hello there how long have you been locked down and then starts talking about stuff and i was like um yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah sorry rory sorry to stop you can you just hit record on your own oh yes sorry and here's record and yeah. then i had to kind of make it sound like it had just started but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um yeah. no i mean i really envy that um when i spoke to hugh uh, todd he was like um he said uh, rory's great because if you'll just ask him one question he'll just steer that for about an hour as you say and he'll come up with soundbite after soundbite and I really envy that yeah. gift with words but um, but the one thing we didn't get out of Rory was uh, really anything about music and um, I don't <laughs> well, there you are you've been as successful as I was on mine yeah uh, because I didn't finish my questions but yeah. so well so how about we um, how about we dig into a bit of that because um, yeah, is that behind you is that a load of vinyls or have I misread the situation it's not. It, I've got a load of vinyls. There are all sorts of magazines and all sorts of nonsense, really. Uh, stuff right. that my wife wants to chuck out. But um, hey. I have got lots of. I didn't. I didn't get rid of my vinyls in the big vinyl clearance days of the early nineties. I kept. Yeah. Them. Yeah, yeah. I spoke to um, Steve Albini uh, in Chicago. He's got he's a recording engineer. He has a big thing about still recording on tape because he says, you know, you can get a tape from 1961 and it still plays on a Studio tape machine and sounds exactly as it is. However, you cannot use a floppy oh, disk. Really? Yeah, you, CDs are disappearing. Soon USB will probably go. So the digital formats expire very quickly, but uh, some physical yeah. stuff just stays and presumably your vinyl still sound good. Yeah, absolutely. Strange that it's made a comeback. He's really famous, isn't he, Steve Albini? He's he's he refers to himself as a music industry D-list celebrity. I think maybe Z-list, but um, I've heard of him. yeah, I've yeah. Heard of him. He must be higher than that. Yes, he's very um, 
He's he, he's very uh, widely known about in the industry, but he's um, because of you know he worked on a Nirvana, PJ Harvey, and a few big artists like that. But famously, he he waived all his uh, royalties and said, "I'm just the engineer. Just pay me an upfront fee." So he's oh, um, God, really? yeah, financially. Uh, when I spoke to him for this podcast, you know, he said I might be losing my studio because of COVID nineteen. So I kind of was really wishing he'd taken some of that Nirvana money. But his ethics are very strong and integrated. So. Sure. Yeah. So, um, what's your relationship with the uh, music like? Is it quite important to you, or is it on the side? Do you just get make time for it when you can? Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's been very very important. Um, strangely, as any of my ex creative partners will tell you, uh, sometimes it, it would cause problems. I I would listen to music while working all the time. Every in the, partly in the days when we had offices, I would be playing music all the time whilst working. So I'd find it sort of calming and and you sort of chill out and focus and set some mood and whatever. So uh, yeah, I've always always been into music. Yeah, is there a particular record that turned you onto it that uh, that you remember being your first favourite record? My first favourite record. Um, God, difficult to mm. pin it down exactly. I mean, the earliest ones I can remember hearing, and I don't know whether it's accurate, is Penny Lane by obviously the Beatles. Um, the first ones I would have bought, I think, would be Sweet Blockbuster. Do you know that? I actually don't, so I'll have to you give know, it a go. That's a little treat for you when you've got time. <laughs> Uh, and the first album, which I talked to someone about the other day, uh, which you also may not have, is the Goodies first album. No, I'm, fam- the I'm, I'm familiar with the Goodies. I don't have that. Their... Terrific when people don't know any of these references because they're too young. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they were the sort of early ones. So I would have been in the sort of glam rock, you know, slightly too young for most of the 60s music at the time but the sort of early 70s. So when I would have first got into it, it would have been all the glam rock, Alice Cooper, Sweet, David Bowie, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, what was the... uh... What was the what was the, what was the mood like at the time for you? Was that quite a um, was that was that your teenage years? Was that um, that would yeah. have been slightly younger? Uh, All right. Yeah, slightly younger. Um, uh, I can't remember the mood then. That would have been when I was like, yeah, it would have been. God, I don't know. Uh, just trying to work out the numbers. Hmm. Eight, something like that. Ten. Yeah. Um, and then teenage years, I would have got into a thing called jazz funk. Okay. Do you know what that, you know what How, that is? Uh, I know. I know about it insofar as um, it's. Uh, it sounds like the kind of thing Howard Moon would say in the Mighty Boosh. But uh, yeah. I, I, I fast forward to jazz fusion with like Weather Report and Jaco Pastore okay. and things like that. Yeah, that's a bit more highbrow. Jazz funk was a sort of funny little anomaly around the late seventies, early eighties. Um, that was sort of a version of jazz bit like uh people would make fun of it at the time and in retrospect rightly so it was a bit like elevator music uh so oops sorry that's my <laughs> phone again um uh yeah so i would have oh, sorry the price of being Hang successful on, get this oh. after that i sort of then started to sort of search into all sorts of music and um so then I would like things like uh, Nick Drake. Do you know Nick Drake? Yeah, yeah, we've got a Nick Drake album in here. Have you really? Well, that's interesting. So, um, so, I, so for example, with I chanced upon one of his albums when I would have been um, 17, 18, and it was, nobody had heard of him at the time, and it was just in one of these sort of remainder bins for about one ninety nine. And thought, God, that's amazing. So I used to buy that as a present for, you know, when I was sort of teenager for various friends. Mm-hmm. And because um, I thought it was really good and it was strange that nobody had ever heard of it. And uh, one of the friends that I bought it for was a photographer and director called Malcolm Venville. And um, I got him a couple of albums over different Christmases and birthdays. 
And then he was shooting a job in America as a director for uh, Arnold, an ad agency. And they were finishing up another ad that um, that they were trying to get Prince's... Uh, he's got a song with Moon in it, and I can't think what it's called now. Is it Under the Purple Moon or something? I can't remember. There's so many Prince songs, I always have to go through like a huge filing yeah. cabinet in my head. So, got yeah. Moon in it. And, he, and he, anyway, they'd reject it. They wouldn't let him use it. And the creators said, oh, look, have a look at this. We're trying to find some music. So because I'd bought my mate all these Nick Drake out, I'd force them on him, trying to get him to like him. He said, oh, I know a song, Pink Moon. It's about, you know, it's got moon in it. So he pointed them towards that. They used that and it launched, it kicked off Nick Drake's career. Wow. Uh, so it's a funny little, you know, so I'm taking full responsibility for that. Yeah, I had a so similar... I would sort of buy those and hand them out a lot, hoping that people would like them. And it somehow linked to Malcolm having that when that Volkswagen ad was being made. He recommended that and that was on a Volkswagen ad. And then all of a sudden in America, like tons of people bought Nick Drake stuff. And it's all really, so it's a peculiar little thing, but um, yeah. Yeah, I had a similar thing with um, Paul Burke, our mutual friend. Yep. He... Uh, um, it was talking about his experience where I can't remember the agency he was at, but they it was they were doing British Gas, and they wanted a particular record they couldn't get hold of, and so Paul says he just brought them Blur. The Universal says this is a bit like it, and then that got synced to British Gas. Oh and well, they, really? He's not. Yeah. I know Paul. He's not told me that. <laughs> yeah, I have to see if I can. Uh, well, I'll I'll produce the clip from my podcast and then I'll sell it to you for lots of money. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it'll get twenty views, but. Um, no disrespect to Paul. Yeah, so it's been uh, present, and you've um, had in had an influential role in uh, some careers, um, which is interesting because this is what we get to do as ad people. We're always trying to break the next big song. In fact, we we had a request yeah. from from a fashion agency, and they wanted modern, grime, hard, aggressive, uh, female fashion thing like Pretty Little Thing and Misguided. But we found this perfect track by a Norwegian artist uh, called Anna of the North Dead. Like beautiful sound like the 70s really soft and, and a warm sound and they said you know well, it's not really on the brief of uh, aggressive so that got pushed to one side and then a few months later uh, apple synced it for their ipad advert and it got <laughs> millions and millions wow. of streams yeah so <laughs> so we, we always... go. that goes back to what we were saying earlier that if you're in the creative industries the thought of doing something that everybody takes note of, notice of like that is sort of exciting you know yeah, and um, but I, yeah, I always feel as the music supervisor, I don't know how many people would be impressed if I told them, you know, sort of over a glass of wine. It's like, yeah, I sync to the uh, Anna of the North tracks, so, you know. But uh, yeah. um, that seems like you know, so the, the the work is the the thing that's impressive, and being the one that placed it, you're just sort of a part of that that show. But it's always still a great thing to be able to do and to have that influence and to bring something you love to other people. Yeah. Um, and um, you were talking about, just briefly before, you were talking about what the music was you were into when you were growing up, but was there anything that particularly uh, uh, wound up your your parents? Were you a punk at any point? or I wasn't a punk, no. Um, <laughs> uh, I can't really remember anything winding up. I remember liking Alice Cooper as mm -hmm. a young child, and uh, that seemed to be derided, partly because he was called Alice. He had long hair hmm. um and he was a bit peculiar um but i can't really remember any music i mean they weren't my parents weren't really uh, into music my mum had uh, it just makes me laugh to think of it now one cassette in her car which was simon and garfunkel's greatest hits so she would go to work and put it on and then come back and put it on and then go to work and put it on yeah <laughs> it's just one cassette it was just, just bizarre yeah. so i've sort of made up with that by buying ludicrous spending ludicrous amounts of money on um music that that keeps getting um, made redundant you know i've got so many cds which i'm now about to sort of almost throw away really because yeah. they sit there covering a wall like an art piece you, you know you don't really reach for them anymore um, yeah but horrifically you know the, some of these things you look at them and you think God, I paid fifteen pounds for that album in yes. nineteen ninety. That must be thirty pounds now. Yeah, and it works fine. What do you do with it? I'm not going to play it. Do we throw it away? Do we? It's not worth anything, really. 
Yeah, there's something now, but... there's something really impressive about the uh, the relative price of CDs when they were on sale, and there's just enormous depreciation in value. And yeah. there's a little there's a little um, my little anecdote about that is my when I was a waiter, my car got broken into, and um, almost everything got taken, including the loose change from near the gear stick, coppers, ten ps, yeah. not a lot of actual capital. They left the CDs. The CDs were worth yeah. less than loose change to them. Well, I, I mean, I've asked people this before I chuck them, but um, vinyl was at the same stage, possibly in 1990. I can't pinpoint the years, but there would have been a point when I remember my cousin sold that, you know, if you'd line up albums that way, yeah. at least that many in a line for about £100. Wow. Because he, he was like delighted. He said, that's £100. I was almost going to throw them away. Wow. Because that's where the, there was a point when they were almost so old fashioned compared to these shiny silver things that didn't scratch. Vinyl, it was like a old Victorian things that you might as well lob them. They're pointless. So people were just getting rid of just bucket loads of these uh, yeah. vinyl records. If you'd have gone to charity shops around that time, you could have, you know, bought 10,000 albums for, you know, nothing. Yeah. Um, and uh, but uh, and obviously at, at some point that changed. People say now that's never going to change with CDs because that's it's just not going to happen. But that's what they thought with uh, vinyl as well. I don't know, but but it doesn't seem like anyone's interested in CDs now. But they were at least double. I think when they came out, they were at least they were like double and treble the cost of the vinyl. Yeah, yeah. Because and this they is were so advanced and technological. Yeah, and this is what accounts for in in in, in no small part the fattening up of the music industry when the budgets were like in the advertising industry at one point allegedly when the budgets were insane hmv yeah. would have like a week-long binge as their you know as their annual party somewhere in ibiza because they just yeah. sold so many cds you know and uh musicians became millionaires uh and and i don't know because there's always this debate going on at the moment with the, with the with the musos about spotify you only get a fraction of a penny for a stream and uh, how unfair is that? But then a stream is definitely not equivalent to a sale. It's like, you know, if you bought an album, you could listen to that a hundred times. So how much should a stream be worth? But yeah. I feel like I'm being a bit unfair when I I reflexively think people are complaining because you used to be able to become fabulously rich as a musician and now people can't as much. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the... You're right that you can't compare. It's not, a, you know streaming something from spotify is not the same as buying it and also you still get fabulously rich pop stars now making tens yes. of millions i yes. don't know whether there's less of them or more of them um but um so uh, i don't know i think that basically the the cd heralded the um the sorry the cd the main thing that made them all rich was the fact that they then realized they could sell their back catalog again. So yes. I think before the CD, people didn't used to try and shift their back catalogs as much. But then, I see what you mean, yeah. But what happened is all of a sudden they thought, as well as new records, we could, we could sell someone who's got an old copy of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. We can give them a shiny new CD as well. So even mm. though they own it, they might buy that, and then yeah. they might buy that. They might buy Let's Get It On, and then all of the, all of a sudden the back catalogue started to be a much bigger asset. So certain certain stars would almost sell all their albums all over again on a yeah. different format that was more expensive. I think they were cheaper to knock out than vinyl. Yes, but they were twice as you know. But they were, um, I don't know, you know, twice as so it cost a fraction to produce, but they would sell them at twice as much. So. Yeah, there was a ton of profit in there. And of course, then you would get the the burgeoning balloon of something I particularly detest, which is, um, I don't know what the collective term is, is for it, but something like, you know, um, uh, extraneous assets, greatest hits, bonus tracks, remastered yeah, edition, yeah. Yeah. reselling the same rope over and over again. Yeah. And um, Yeah, I mean, my friend used to say, they'd always have these stickers that said, bonus previously unreleased tracks, and he mocked up a sticker that said something like previously 
tracks previously considered shit or something. Contains tracks previously yes. considered shit or something like that, which is true. It would be all this sort of outtakes. Occasionally they'd be interesting, but generally there were things that they didn't think were any good at the time. But Yeah, you could um, put a question out to everyone. What's everyone's favourite bonus track? Or can you even remember yeah. one? You know, and yeah. Um, you're, and, and yeah, I see where you're... Um, I see where, yeah, I see where you're going with that. But one thing that interested me as well was that you mentioned Marvin Gaye, What's Going On. And with all the conversations yeah. I have, that seems inescapably like a great record that everyone just knows is a masterpiece forever. And the album is what it is. It's track one to, I think, nine, and that's it. I don't want more tracks that got cut from the release. It's not part of the yeah. same painting. Yeah, well, there's obviously a difference in now people, you know, it's almost gone back to the... Uh, 50s and 40s and in that it's all uh singles rather than albums and i read recently about someone it might have been fiona apple but um although it, she's just putting her albums out on um even when it's on spotify i think it's going to be side one and it's very much a specific order and it and they link into each other so trying to make an album again because obviously people are don't make albums that they they're considering the um track listed and how they sort of flow into each other as much because people are just grabbing you know on their playlist just grabbing this one and that one and the sort of structure of the album itself was probably um fallen by the wayside a bit yes uh all the all the artists that i know and most of the um, genuine <laughs> genuine most of the music fans i know people who are proper devotees of the art form they still want albums and yeah. uh, i suspect the playlisting thing is going to be another anomaly we're still going to want a complete body of work but um you're right insofar as people will not if they're not proper devoted fans they won't put on the whole album on spotify they will do the playlisting thing and interestingly playlisting has become so much has become so influential in music culture that um, I don't know how much you know about how you would get a record out previously, but you're familiar with the uh, the, the the business of plugging. Yeah, yeah. So people, you know, obviously, people would pay extortionate amounts of money for someone who had a relationship with. Yeah, oh, here, here I am blanking on old DJs, Simon Mayo, yeah, and um, yeah. and so um, now playlisting is the thing, and everyone there are so many things coming to me. As, as a artist and a producer on Instagram and everything. So in a little advert saying, if you pay us 30 quid, we'll get you on this Spotify playlist that everyone listens to. And that's the new radio. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I heard the other day that um, because of playlists, I think Spotify on Spotify, Queen are the most successful um, British group because they're on the most playlists because their stuff is most appropriate to take across a, a number of different uh, genres yes which is surprising to me because they they don't seem like the best British no, group but no, not only do they they seem quite specific Every, they seem like they were my first favorite band when i was 13 were but, they really yeah because i heard don't stop me now at alton towers and i was like what's this i need all of this but um yeah. but um yeah this queen are I, every, I think a lot of people would say they're a really great band, but I know what you mean. I think very few people would say, oh, well, they, they're not really the best band of all time from Britain because most of the albums are crap, but all the singles are great. Yeah. You know, great live performances, but a bit indulgent and, you know, like... It feels like they've got 12 great songs, but yes. not... I don't know whether I'd listen to a Queen album, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and I know what you mean. It's, it seems interesting. It, it would seem... So the claim there was that they have this kind of genre diversity that enables them to be placed everywhere. But they're also so yeah. esoteric and so like specifically Queen that I can't imagine them blending into anything. Yeah, I don't know. Supposedly that's the that's the data they've got on it. Um, and then obviously you've got uh, in stadiums in America. I can't remember which songs it would be, um, but they've got very chanty. They're good for sort of. Certain songs are great for stadiums and sports events, aren't they? Queen songs. We will rock you, and we are the champions. We they just produce. We are the champions. Yeah, yeah. There's certain ones that are perfect for that, and you hear them a lot in those. But um, yeah, and then and then when people listen to the playlists that, that they'll put on, one of the most popular is is what was it called? Chilled piano or something. Yeah. Um, so all these sort of 
so in a way that that sort of playlist is almost like a best-selling album in terms yeah. of the amount of people listening to it but yeah. they probably couldn't name you anyone on it yeah you know it plays away it tinkles away in the background yeah um, they interestingly on the idea of not the real thing becoming the real thing as in not really an album becoming the best-selling album um yeah. J- james cross at bbc creative i think it was him told me this thing that the reason led zeppelin finally put themselves on streaming services was because um a led zeppelin cover band were the only option and they'd become fantastically wealthy because led zeppelin oh, really? fans had gone to listen to them yeah. yeah and got that so they had to beat their own um, doppelgangers yeah yeah, spite is often drives a lot of these things. Yeah, so um, in um, back into advertising creative, what's your? Do you have a, an example of the best music you can remember from an advert, synced or composed? Um, God, I mean, all the usual, you know, all the usual ones. It's um, um, I mean, there's so many. It's difficult to know where to begin. I think. Um, you know, it's, it's it's an interesting process. Obviously, you do it every day, but the process of trying to choose tracks for ads is 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 um, disproportionate. The effect that it has is disproportionately large. It's just like a, like a missing jigsaw piece. You know, you get the right thing. I remember we once had um, or Mercedes, and um, after going through lots of music, someone had suggested. Nico's these days do you know mm, them yeah which is fantastic yeah and it just all of a sudden made the ad it made it like twice as good you know sometimes you put these things together and it's like uh magic it just everything is improved um and it was amazing and it was all cleared until it, it we found out it was a jackson brown song and he has got a specific thing that he won't allow any piece of music in any ad so even if it's something he's written but someone else has recorded so although nico had recorded it so we had to to lose it and you know i can't remember what was used in the end but it deteriorated you know it was just not a fraction as good as uh, these days but um i don't i mean there's so many good ads with good music i don't know which ones have come up i mean obviously nope. levi's and guinness and um uh, I quite liked. Uh, it wasn't a great ad, but I loved the use of Sati in a um, in the early nineties, which I used to love. There was a sort of um, building society ad that used to play. Uh, not Jim Nopardy. It was one of it. Sati other ones that was brilliant. Um, I liked. I think um, a slightly weird one was the John Webster ad for the Royal Bank of Scotland, where they had these little Giacometti figures and it was a Benjamin Britten song, not song, tune. And it was very strange and um, amazing, I thought. I mean, he was amazing with that. I don't know whether you know John Webster's stuff. I've not gone into John Webster, yeah. Choices were um, brilliant, you know. yeah, I don't know. I can't think of any other other than those off the top of my head. No, but you are right that the ones that always come up are Guinness Surfer and um, yeah. and Levi's almost across the board. They've got. It seems like music has got more and more proportionally expensive, a bigger part of the production schedule than it used to be, yeah. which obviously then restricts restricts the, your sort of choices. Yes, I think Paul said something similar about when he was telling me his British gas story. He said at at one point you would just put a track on it, and you wouldn't have. Yeah. You know, there's now a plethora of music supervisors, um, right, yeah. and I take it at one point that wasn't the case. Yeah, but um, no, no, it was a new area at one point. The sort of the people who would, the specialist music people who would advise you, and I think I'm right in saying that when um, BBH first started the Levi's campaign in the '80s, that they would do deals where it was almost like it was good for the the '60s soul track to be put on the Levi's ad to get exposure and then to get back in the charts and i don't know whether any money even changed hands you know the deals that were being done then obviously now they would they would be classic soul tracks that would possibly be even unaffordable but then it was a a different yeah different time 
Yeah, I mean, there's been a few big tracks that um, we've had to go and search for that, you know, the, the negotiations start uh, in six figures. And so, yeah. you know, we have to say that's the production budget isn't even that that you're asking for for the track. You know, I think uh, a lot of musicians or music industry types, they won't be they won't be foolish. The people doing their sync deals will know exactly what they're playing with. But I do think some people imagine that it's like being synced in a feature film in perpetuity. And they go, well, we think 500 grand's fair enough for this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. Um, but uh, the examples that, uh, th- there's a couple of examples that I really like that um, that don't seem to come up and they haven't stuck in people's memory. There's one for, um, uh, there's one by Adam and Eve in 2009 for a campaign called No Child Born to Die and it used a track called Pie and a Bee and it was just a cello and a piano, I think, on a weird like vinyl loop. One of the most emotionally like heart-wrenching adverts yeah. I've ever seen. But um, that was good. And um, did you see the recent McDonald's ad by Leo Burnett for the Nightworkers? Yeah, well, I can't remember the music off the top of my head. What was the music? It was an emotional rendition of Rhythm of the Night. Right. But um, as in this is the rhythm of the night. But yeah, yeah, I thought it was a great piece of work. I just, I mean, I'm one of those annoying people who go straight into people's uh, email or LinkedIn to say, that was amazing. It went to uh, Steph and yeah, Rory, yeah. the creative. No, good for you. <laughs> but yeah, those yeah. are... Two, two that are quite close uh, that all come up straight away for me. Um, you mentioned the Mercedes um, example that fell by the wayside because because Jackson Brown just wasn't in the sync business. But have you ever seen, have you ever had an yeah. ad you worked on where you were like, that's the track, and then the client has gone, no, 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 that's not really what I want? Um, yeah, I mean, all the, all the, the, the that's the sort of negotiation all the time. I think... Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a difficult it's a difficult balance. You've got the cost, the differing views on what's right for the brand. You know, um, I remember I used to uh, I used to work on Aston Martin, and uh, <laughs> and in one of the meetings, the client said, um, obviously Aston Martin couldn't be a more premium sophisticated brand and uh in one of the meetings when we were going through some work the client said can i ask you a question it's not specifically about this but uh, just just to get a, a take so I said, yeah he said um uh, i think it is. what do you think of duran duran so I was like, what a weird thing you know a minute ago we were talking about their marketing and, and you think is it his brother or what's the yeah. what's his connection why is he asking me so i said not really my cup of tea. And he went, why is that? I said, I don't know. I, you know, we talked yeah. about it for a bit. He said, because we're thinking of doing a tie-up deal to support all their concerts around the world. And you think, Duran Duran and Aston Martin, they just seem so wrong. Yeah, Duran Duran, 30 Chalk years after their, yeah. they were big. Um, so, but, to, but uh, the point I say that is to him... He obviously liked Duran Duran, so it's so the 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 it, it's a fantastically subjective thing, you know. It's so it's tough. So when you're recommending things or I'm recommending things, you would hope that there's a little bit of um, science. It's not purely, you know. I wouldn't be re- recommending Sweets Blockbuster just because I listened to it as a child and it was my first single. But some people would think. Hang on, maybe we could get Sweets Blockbuster for this Aston Martin, and it could be really cool uh, because that's what they like. That's the lens they see it through. So, you, it, so it's quite difficult when you're dealing with um, some clients. You, we've all got our subjective subjective views on it, and trying to assess what's right for the brand, what's right for this particular idea or this film. This person likes chirpy chirpy cheap cheap. This one likes, you know. Gymnopodies by whoever, you know, it's a, it's difficult. It's difficult to wrangle these different opinions and subjectivities. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's always one that we find is uh, trying to mitigate for uh, client taste at bo- at all levels. So there's us. There's what we like as individuals because you know my MD is yeah. from the eighties and identifies with punk and. You know, I was born in the 90s and, you know, I have my own set of tastes. Uh, 
and then you know the the creatives will uh, usually try and put something in and then at the end level the client goes then? you know what i want portugal the man how do you make sense of that situation <laughs> well we just try uh well first of all we try and put our tastes in the studio aside and we you know w- it depends what the brief is. Our favourite type is where we basically compose on the fly. You know, the edit comes in and it's like, all right, let's compose something to this yeah. track when we like to imagine we are John Williams or Hans Zimmer. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's there's old compositions that never made it, so we pull those on. And, um, you know, if it's and then, you know, something that we might sync. And then usually it's a case of here's why we think yeah. these are working, um, not here's why we like logic-based this. logic-based argument? I guess it must and be. And that's the conversation degree. starter. Sometimes, it, if you're going for a certain marketplace, so we had a campaign that was a youth campaign at the start of this year, and the track the client really liked was quite retro, uh, in a not yeah. in a in an M&S way. It would appeal to that marketplace, and um, we were saying the marketplace you're trying to access is into Travis Scott, Lil Uzi Vert. They're into Anderson Pack. They're into uh, Ariana Grande. So we recommend something along these lines and, you know, so yes, it, uh, the, 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 the marketplace, uh, and what we think they are listening to is yeah. often, you know, the, the conversation changer, you know, uh, and the thing that gets us out of the realm of just what we like. Um, yeah. And the only thing that, in, you know, from the creative level, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had this, uh, creatives mm-hmm. write a campaign with a track in mind, you know, they can see, see it taking shape. So often it's yeah. quite difficult to divorce them from the, the track yeah. they're wedded to. But if it's right, it's right. So, yeah. Yeah. So that tends to be the uh, the, the process. And so um, I feel like, what time is it? Oh, we've gone past half three. Yeah. So half four even, because I can't count. So I thought what might be a good way to... Um, to uh, to wrap this up because I asked this to Hugh and I asked this to a few yeah. people is what's because you talk at colleges and you talk at presumably universities what's your advice to young people who are artists poets performers you know illustrators musicians film directors as to why they would go into advertising and not try and become you know fabulous um, artists in their own right well I, I I don't know I wouldn't have any advice for them really I think. Um, I did it because I saw lots of ads on TV and posters that I thought were clever and that I liked. Uh, and you got well paid in those mm. days. Um, so that's why I did it. I think um, I think obviously now that, you know, when I, when I would have done it in about 1985, there weren't many creative outlets. If you were at art college there weren't many things that you could get into and create stuff. Um, whereas now there's a whole plethora of different avenues that, you know, with sort of Apple gaming, there's sort of endless different things. And, and arguably if, if the, the people are anything like my kids, they're far more likely to be into gaming than advertising or design or any of that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, or tech, you know. So, so it's difficult. So, at the moment, I find it difficult to know how it does. Go. I mean, I think it's an industry problem. I don't know how, as an industry, we get the best minds, the best creative minds coming out of colleges. I've got no idea how we do that because I don't think we present ourselves in a way that looks exciting. Uh, you know, it doesn't treat, I don't think we pay well. We don't treat people well at the moment. It, you know, often the agencies come over as they'll do anything to make a buck. You know, they right. don't really, many don't have a philosophy. So it used to be when I got into it, if you would go to, you know, BBH or Abbott Mead or what, they'd all have their own philosophy and they'd say that client's not right for us or they'd fire this one or they'd only do this or they'd they'd have their own. Whereas now it feels like anyone will pitch for anything to do anything if they run, they'll run good work sometimes and bad work sometimes. And so it's a, uh, so it's very difficult. So, and I've been doing it too long really to sort of get a sense of a good snapshot of what it's like today. Cause I can only compare it to the other times I've been in it. But I can't, 
I, I so I can't. I find it hard to see what's really, really appealing in it. My guess would be that there will be some sort of backlash to the sort of slightly um, stagnant uh, period we're in, uh, and it might get a bit more punchy and interesting and varied, and then that might attract more people to do that kind of thing. But at the moment. Um, you know, most of the sort of, if you watch an ad break uh, or you, you know, pass outdoor posters or look at ads online or whatever it may be, it's very difficult to think, God, I wish I could, I'd like to be part of that. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe people do think that, but I I can't think of, there's the occasional thing you think, God, that's great. I love that. But it seems very occasional for me anyway, but... Uh, so I can't. I don't know. I can't see lots of reasons why they would, why they would want to do that. I mean, I like doing it because that's what I do, and I like the challenge of it and trying to solve problems and make things. And you kind of get used to what you can do. But um, I can't imagine it attracting people away from those other better-paid industries at the moment. Right. So that's um, a challenge for all of us in nice the industry. downer to go out on. Well, no, it's good. I mean, you know, uh, truth is... What the, did the uh, other people say? Did they have reasons why they thought... Hugh just said, um, money. <laughs> right, yeah, well, the, get... money is, the money is has gone down for people mm. in terms of getting in the business. Yeah. You know, when when students get their first job now, it's it's probably the same kind of money that they would have got 20, 25 years ago. Um, what, you're expecting uh, young creatives to be on about 18 or 19 grand a year? Yeah. Wow. And they would have got that or more 25 years ago. Flipping heck. And so it's like, yeah, you don't want to drive them off to financial services. Well, I mean, not that I don't think that's where creatives would no, go but anyway. I think but... it's not, you know, when I got into it, the, the, the talk, and I don't know how accurate it was, but the starting salaries for people in adverti advertising was on par with the legal profession. Wow. Which sounds just even stupid saying that now. It doesn't sound believable, does it? It sounds like I'm making it up. But yeah. um, whereas now it's it's nowhere near that. You know? Do you get the sense that for young people it's like you should be grateful to have this job so there's a bit of a hit on the salary? Maybe, but I don't know why they should be grateful to have that job. Mm. I think people should be grateful for the opportunity of trying to sell some baked beans or... Yeah, uh, an internet service. It's just a job like other things. I think um, I think they should be paid well, you know. Yeah, but I, yeah, but the, the sort of yeah, it goes back to where we started, where because everybody sort of lost their confidence and they weren't sure whether it was digital or traditional. Was that finished? Was this this? And all the fees come collapsing down because people lost their way a bit and lost their confidence. And when the fees collapse, you you have to find new structures, and the new structures are to have lots of underpaid younger people working all hours uh, and not getting rises. Seems that, to be the. That's really interesting because Paul said uh, to me, he may have said it on the th podcast, but I think he also may have said it on the phone. I can't remember which, and he said um, they don't like. Uh, the the creatives the creative industry is a very young industry at the moment, and they don't necessarily want to see old people hanging around it. And that it, it, you know, I interpreted it as a kind of a, a comment on uh, old people not being that <laughs> older people not being that desirable or cool. But now you've said that, it frames it as if that is the case, they want to keep young people around. It's because they don't demand as much money. Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Yeah, mm. um, but certainly the money side is a big factor. Yeah. And there'll be the case of, well, our clients aren't paying us what they used to, so we can't pay you what yeah, we'd like they to. they can't. Absolutely. They can't afford lots of uh, senior talent, you know. Okay. So there's a challenge on our hands to uh, reboot our industry, bring it bring it back from, not from the dead, but it's uh, in some, some kind of sleep. And, uh, yeah, it needs to be cool and desirable and aspirational. And I think maybe that just comes from great content, great ideas. Yeah, I think it's going to come from a, a bunch of younger people being pushy and aggressive and demanding and uh, selfish and doing things that they think will work and not just kind of going along with things for the hell of it and having a bit more uh, self-belief. Yeah. And then 
that well this is what normally happens you know in the history of advertising it sort of it flattens out and then a few agencies turn up and it starts a bit of a trend you know and then people copy that and then it dies and it comes back so there'll be some yeah some new cool kids who come along and do some good stuff and then they will do very well business wise people will say we need to be more like that they're doing really well mm. and they'll copy that and do some more dynamic stuff i would imagine so if we're, if we're in this oscillation of peaks and dips, you'd say that we're in one of the dips at the moment and we're waiting for that new peak? Yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't think... Yeah, I would say so. I mean, who knows? You know, I don't know. People would say... I think people, if they're over 50, they don't like saying it was better before because it makes it sound like they're... Just being nostalgic, fashion. yeah. Nostalgic. Um, but potentially it was better before. So... It's not so it, can't, it couldn't be better in the future or better, but it's very hard to look at the stuff around and think that it's there's loads of great stuff. Yeah, or it's no, exciting. And you are right about the thing about really exciting ads. I think that you know the 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 goal used to be to do things that weren't like other ads. That was the goal, so that yours stood out. How can you create an ad that isn't like other people's? Because um, if you could create something so simple or so different, then it would engage more people and that would be better for that business, whoever's paid for it. Mm. Um, whereas now it feels absolutely like most things go through the same machine. Yeah. Like there's, so there's all a versions of a similar thing. It's very, yeah. uh, very rare to see. No, so I remember, you know, talking about Guinness Surfer as it's probably the law to talk about every time someone <laughs> comes on to talk to you. Yeah. You know, when that first came on, my friends did that. But when that first came on, that was shocking. You can't really imagine it now because you just accept it's Guinness. But that came on and I didn't know what so I was looking around the TV and there was, I didn't know whether it was an ad break or whether that was part of a film. It was such a yep. weird thing. I couldn't get, there's the music's banging away. There's sort of horses coming at you. I couldn't get a handle on it. It was like a really intense odd yeah. thing there's freeze fr like. freeze frames and silence but yeah all of it it was like is this a horror film what is this? what am i watching i couldn't get, get my head around what i was watching yeah obviously because it was amazingly powerful but it wasn't like the other stuff around it it was a thing in its of its own and i think that if you you know if you turn on now you go we're in an ad break yeah you, know, you can turn on you go this is a program this is an ad break because there's some sort of smiling, quite good looking people wandering around talking in a weird way saying, really, where did you get that lovely carpet? Yeah, yeah. That's great. And you think, well, this is an ad. Um, but you don't chance upon something and think, hang on, is this content or is this an ad or is this, you just think, oh yeah, I can tell by how fake everybody is yeah. and how sunny it is that we're in an ad. Um, so obviously that needs to be, that's crazy because there's a thousand flavors out there and we generally use in one or two yeah um and that seems a shame yeah another example light surfer would be the uh, uh the one i always bring up is cadbury's gorilla yeah no yeah. that got, got well, everyone's attention. again that is if you that's another example that i didn't click onto that but if i had have clicked onto that i wouldn't have quite known what i was looking at mm. because it's not like ads it could have been a thing from a vic reeves tv show or it could be an ad or it could be this or it could be it's a sort of odd thing it's a different flavor from yeah. most ads so it was it was strange and um so stands out you know so that, that as i say that was used to be the goal that you create something that isn't like the stuff everybody else is creating so you people engage with it more but. yeah yeah I wonder how much that cost in the air tonight <laughs> oh did, yeah don't i mean it would have been different because it was 11 years ago but still it would have been a fortune but um yeah. but yeah so um i suppose the resounding uh conclusion is we need to <laughs> relearn to think outside the box and not look at uh, an edit if it's a tvc for example and go yeah that looks like that looks like an advert that's good it looks like a professional ad let's go yeah. job done it's like no no the only one i could think of recently recently that fits the brief that you're describing was uh, uncommon london's um brewdog advert on TV yeah. that was like a, it was basically just an out of home billboard with really horrible music on it for yeah. 20 seconds yeah, or so. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. Get back outside okay. the box. <laughs> good. Good luck with that. Getting the industry going, thinking outside the box. 